academic job search, and this series is co-sponsored by Duke Graduate Career Services and the Duke Graduate School. Um, the previous two discussions in the series were on the application or the academic application process and the interview. Those workshops were videotaped, so if you weren't able to make it, you can find them on the postdoc services website, postdoc.duke.edu, under resources. Um, I'd also like to remind you of a great panel coming up tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Moore will be speaking on research statements, faculty job applications, and the faculty selection process. Dr. Noor is the assist, Associate Chair of Biology, and he's a great teacher, wins all kinds of teaching awards, so that's going to be a really good session. It will be held in two and three tier building from 12 to 1 p.m. Today's discussion is on negotiating the faculty job offer. Many of you submitted your questions in advance. Thank you for doing that. So we will start with those questions and then open the floor to questions from the audience. And I'd very much like to thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us. We really appreciate you being here to share your information and expertise with our faculty of our postdocs and our graduate students. Our panelists today are Dr. Mingnam Chen, who is currently a postdoctoral associate in biomedical engineering, and he is soon to be assistant professor of pharmaceutics and pharmaceutical chemistry at the University of Utah. Minyang sent out 20 applications, got seven interviews, and received three offers, so he has quite a tell to tell about negotiating. Uh, next to him is Dr. James Sita, the Vice Provost for Research and Professor of Biology. Dr. Deborah Silver, Assistant Professor for Molecular Genetics and Microbiology. And Dr. George Trusky, Professor and Chair of Biomedical Engineering. So I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves and briefly talk about how they have been involved in the negotiation process or in Minyang's case, his experience as a recently successful candidate. And then we'll start with the questions. Um, as Molly said, I have uh, three offers. So uh, I'll start with these three offers. Um, the three offers kind of like a boy into two to have one. Two of them had the, you know, kind of started with a very limited offer. It's not very satisfactory. Another one actually come beginning with a quite a substantial uh, you know, stand up, start up fund and the salary and all other aspects. So so outcome is for those two with a, a very limited offer, I was able to um, you know to negotiate for successfully for one of them actually bring the start of fund and salary uh, to like a substantially higher um, for example, startup fund um, uh, actually be increased by you know 50 percent, um, and uh, for another one, it's, it's I was had, although I did a lot of work by negotiating with them, but uh, it was not successful. They only increased the startup fund by you know ten thousand um, dollars. So, so but uh, and uh, for for another successful, very original, very competitive offer. Um, that offer is already higher than the other two, so there's really you know, not much uh, space for negotiation. Um, but I did uh, be able to ask a little bit more start of fund and uh, a little bit uh, releasing in terms of teaching load, uh, which actually is also important because you know the time is also money, so uh, you're working less for teaching, you basically kind of get on more, more your fund too. Um, so, I will I give the more details when you have questions, but I, I think as a conclusion for that, I think that to be successful, you have to know yourself program very well. You really can present your program uh, with the money, uh, with the price tag with that. You know how much cost is your research program. Uh, because they already hire you, so they buy your program, so now it's really you sell your program in, in, like, in that price. Um, second, uh, and also you need to clearly know the distinction between what you need and what you want, because they basically always, probably always have uh, by what you need. And uh, the, the another point I want to say is you really you want to know more about the program, like uh, what they have offered recently. So, um, so basically, uh, you will not get into very significant different amount of fund or salary compared to other faculty. So if you already get into that range or even a little bit higher, so you probably know what you are going to get. Um, 
And also the reason you want no model while you program, because when you negotiate with them, you want to show them why their investment to you will also help their department or their school or their university. But, but for you to present them the case, you have, have to know what they need, what they want by hiring you. Um, the third part, I guess you all would agree, is when you negotiate with some, someone, they always have to be flexible and creative to create some win-win situation or option and uh, present them to them. Um, the last point is um, don't be afraid of the ask what you need and, uh, and of course be prepared to ask it in a very rational way. Um, then you will get successful. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. well, yeah, my name is Jim Cito. I'm, I'm a vice provost for research and also a professor in the biology department. And I've been here 35 years. So uh, when I came here, they gave me $5,000 to set up. <laughs> 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 so, so, and, and, a, uh, and a hunting license to go out and get grants. Um, but, uh, so so I, don't, I don't bring a fresh perspective in that regard, but I think we do two of our, our uh, panelists do. Uh, so I've, I've been around for a long time. Involved in the research enterprise here, I, I sort of get to see the range of, of things that offers that are made across the board. So I'm sort of here as I'm kind of here as a generalist today. Hi, I'm Debbie Silver. I got here a year ago, so I probably have a similar um, perspective I can give you, give you when I answer questions. So um, just I guess a little bit about my negotiating. I ended up with three offers. Um, I think the one thing that that the one piece of advice that I got, which which I held to, was not to negotiate unless I was really serious. One of the places I didn't bother negotiating with, I just decided off it wasn't the right offer for me and it wasn't the right place. Um, and when I started negotiating, I, you basically don't want to start asking for everything under the sun. They're not going to take you seriously, and you have to envision that you're going to be a colleague with these people when you arrive. So you don't want to offend people, um, you know, before you even get there. In terms of asking for too much, um, let's see what else. The other, the other thing that, um, the other general piece of advice was, I negotiated when possible. I think it's best to negotiate in either in person or by phone, uh, rather than simply just listing an email what you want. Um, I think it shows that you really have thought about what you need. In terms of, you, you definitely want to ask for what you need rather than again asking for $50,000 just to have it, just to show that you have a higher package than your friend, for example. I mean, obviously that's not the right way to go. Um, so I negotiated by phone because that was the most feasible for me. And, um, and then we had some back and forth emails in terms of what was going to work. And uh, I guess those are the two main points that I would say. Definitely don't, don't negotiate just to negotiate. But this definitely is the time to not be timid. So you, you certainly want to think about what you need. If you look at a package, and it's sort of hard, right? Because you're coming from postdoc, you're trying to figure out what you need to start your lab, and you don't really know until you're you know knee deep in it. But in as much thought as you can have, I would sh say show your if you have if you can take advantage of this office or your PI and show people your startup package. Ask them if it sounds reasonable. Think about the resources that are at the university, that are nearby the university that you might be able to take advantage of. Um, but, I mean, those things are sort of obvious, but I think the one thing is definitely um, think about the fact that when you're negotiating, even if you start, if, even if you're thinking about a relationship with the place that you choose not to go to, you don't want to offend them either. So, you know, this is sort of networking. Hi, I'm uh, George Trusky. Um, I've been the chair of the Biomedical Engineering Department for eight and a half years and finishing up my term. Um, and I've been involved in a number of faculty recruitments uh, since I've been chair. We've, probably, we've hired about um, six assistant professors. Um, and so I've been, there's, there's only a difference in when you're recruiting assistant professors versus more senior faculty. So. But I think philosophically our goal is that when we put out an offer, this is a person that we want. At, at the same time, we obviously can't just, you know, there's a limit to our budget, so we have to, there's clearly a negotiation. Um, philosophically, 
uh, you know, um, in thinking about this, the, the goal of the startup package is to provide sufficient support for you for several years so that you can gather preliminary data and put out strong proposals. And then that's how you should think about it. Um, the way I've often worked with the um, candidates is that, um, one, I, I have a, a ballpark number in mind for, for the package, um, uh, just based on, on prior packages and discussions with colleagues and other institutions, just so I have a rough idea. But it's not like a single dollar amount. And I, I usually ask the individual to provide a, um, a list of what they feel that they need. Um, and oftentimes, uh, I mean, they're usually very good lists that they come back. They often come in higher than what we can afford. <laughs> um, but uh, that's when the discussion starts. Um, um, and, and that information usually seems to be informed. They're talking to their postdoc mentor. They may be talking to other members of the lab, <coughs> other assistant professors, and so forth. So they're gathering information about what they need. Um, and you know, the negotiation is usually about how can we meet your needs and live within our means, too, for providing you what you need. Um, and um, <clears throat> so that may, and, and I think the most challenging part is when there's a very specialized piece of equipment that comes into play that's very expensive. That can be the most challenging part. Uh, otherwise, usually we can, we can work things out in terms of making the applicant know what resources are available to them generally and how they can accommodate things. We also, um, in, in our offer letters, don't hold them to the exact equipment list, so that allows them to be somewhat creative and try. You know, when, when, once they get a reasonable amount that everyone's happy with, because it, um, uh, but I think that's the important part that people are satisfied with with the actual um, startup package. Um, uh, and, and the last comment I'll make before um, the, the open discussion is. Uh, I always talk through what the offer letter will look like, uh, either in person or over the phone, because every, different departments or different institutions have different policies. We, we, in our department, we're on the university side, so we break ours out in terms of how much will be for equipment and supplies and whether you want to use it for postdoctoral support. Um, and then we have a separate line for um, what would be graduate student support, since that's coming from a different source. Um, if there's any summer salary and, then, and any uh, uh, moving expenses. So those are usually all itemized. Other places just lump it all together. So you, you want to be clear about how that money is, is distributed. So. Thank you. you. You sort of touched on this in your answer, Debbie and George, but when does the negotiating process actually start? Should you come to your first campus interview, like on with your list of what you need, or does it not happen until you've gotten home and you get a phone call? Or an email. Um, yeah, you definitely don't want to assume anything for first interview. <laughs> it's probably somewhat. Um, but I mean, at the same time, you need to. You're you're not me. You're they're interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. You need to look around and see if they have the resources that are going to be reasonable. You got asked back for a second visit. You might decide that there's no way you could survive there. I mean, there's no way your research would do well. So but you definitely have to be thinking long term when you're interviewing. Um, I think if you're interviewing it, and you, you, know, you need a mass spectrometer or access to a mass spectrometer, you know, that's why I'm certainly liable to come up during, during the interview process, just because people, they're going to want to know, you know, what sort of person we're hiring and what his or her needs might be. Uh, but the, the notion of, yeah, don't pull out a list. Yeah. <laughs> and, and usually, as Jim said, you're, you're, the, the institution is thinking of the resources you'll need with we always try to get some idea in advance, and so we uh, will, uh, especially in the second interview, show them you know, re resources and take them around so they can see what they need. And it's usually, um, uh, we, the negotiation in our case usually doesn't start to get serious until we have the, uh, the finalists. So that's after the second interview in our case. So there, there may be some discussion, and usually after the second interview, I'll often tell them that, you know, if you haven't, so I can put together a list of, of your needs. And you should probably be thinking of that already and have that developed before you even go to any, any interviews. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the places that I got offers, I had a second visit there. And when I had the second, one place I had a second visit to, it, it was still an interview. Um, but three of the other places, it was, it was um, a more of a recruitment. And at that point, I sat down with the chairs and 
had a discussion about what I was going to need to be successful. Um, and then, so it was, that was essentially somewhat of a negotiation, but I guess at that point it's not, they're not putting anything out there concrete, but I'm telling them what I'm going to need. And then, and then at, at two of the places I actually got written, written offers and then, and then thought about negotiating after that. So that was when I did the more formal negotiation. Yeah, I can't, I can't speak so much for the medical center or even engineering for that matter, but in arts and sciences, it, it, basically there's a first round of interviews where they're looking at people and the, the only person, generally the only bring the person back that they're really interested in for, for a second interview. So at that point, uh, you are really in more serious uh, sort of semi-negotiation mode than even if you haven't received the job offer quite at that point. Yeah, it would, it would be good to clarify the second interview. I know in our department we often bring the top two candidates back uh, and they, we ask them at that point to give a talk, talk about their future plans, what's their first grant going to look like. But sometimes that can be the first interview too. So you do want to be clear and they should be like, they should make it clear that like you're the person we want, we're bringing you back again to make you happy versus, you know, we, we you know, this is the second interview, we're still in, in the decision mode. So that should be kind of clear. And you know, is that your experience as well? Um, yeah, mostly it is, but in one case is um, at the exit of the first interview, the chair bring me to his office. <laughs> um, he did give me a picture like what's the start of fund range and the salary range. Uh, I guess that's special because at that time I already have another two offer, so he know that uh, he know that. So he kind of like uh, also want me to you know not to sort of put on hope for something very dra dramatically lower or unsatisfying. So it, it, it is a good thing about that. Uh, I think what I want to emphasize a little bit is what the judge said. Yeah, although they probably probably do not want to um, pull up your list at the first interview, but you probably also definitely want to be prepared. People ask you about that. You need some special instruments, and if you can you know a little bit of cost for that instrument, so um, then definitely put you a good position. So you really thought through about your research program. Yeah, I would, I would echo that because, you know, if they ask a question, they, they need to know that you actually have an idea about what goes into running a research program in terms of what your needs are going to be and what your costs are. What your, so, I, I, that's true. I actually don't want to have questions like that in terms of how do you, how do you envision your group. And do you typically negotiate with the chair or with the committee? I think it's the chair. Okay, let's back up a little bit and talk about, so, just in, what is Stardust? I mean, oh, sorry. Yep, yeah, question. Sorry. <coughs> so I guess that was one of my questions, was who are you negotiating with and what, where are they getting their funds from? Is it mainly from the university or who are the higher ups? How are they? Is that just a budget deal from their perspective? I guess we're the inner workings of me as an assistant professor coming in and negotiating with the department chair. What is their obligation to their department? And obviously they're bringing somebody in to as something the department they feel is necessary, how are they pulling the funds together to make sources? Well, that is not a huge period of range to kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, because I mean, if you're negotiating, in most every instance I know of, you're negotiating with the chair, and the chair is the, sort of the designated, the designated departmental person. The funding of, of, of departments and departments and have been varies uh, across, across the, even within this university on the medical side, departments are funded radically differently than, than uh, they are on, on the uh, campus side, where uh, departments actually on, on the campus, well, on the arts and sciences, let me speak of biology, for example, uh, they really don't have access to a lot of funds, and so they, uh, in fact, the chair will, will negotiate, will, will get uh, a figure, or have a figure, come with the figure for, for the candidate, and then they'll go to the dean, and actually most of the money then comes from the dean. Now that's sort of, you know, that's kind of transparent to the candidate. You really wouldn't know where the, where the money was coming from. Uh, and, and the notion of, of, uh, of you negotiating with the dean, that, that just basically you're still, you're going to negotiate with the chair even though the dean's the one at the end of the day coming up with the money uh, and, and, and might even come to me, for example, and other sources to get money for things like large equipment. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it really varies considerably. Lots of, there's 
lots of universities where the departments are the source of, 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 of funds. So, for example, if you were at NC North Carolina State looking at a job there, uh, the departments control a lot of their own resources. So that, that chair is basically dealing with his money as, as opposed to going to the dean and sort of negotiating for their money. Uh, no, I, I think that's, that's accurate. Uh, the only thing I would add to it, at least in terms of the positions, before each academic year, the departments make a request to the dean about hiring. So in that, they, they have a budget number for a salary. There's full flexibility, so that part of it's set. But this, and there's a rough estimate of startups, but they're always dealt with differently. And I think Jim summarized uh, uh, how it's done at Duke and, and, and other states and institutions are, are somewhat different. But you're, you're almost always negotiating with, with, with the chair and, and not, not say going to the dean or anything like that. So uh, what is startup money? Do you get to keep it forever? And what's typically included in the startup right. package? Um, I, I, get, I think there is a very different thing to do. Um, at the University of Utah, which I will join, I think that they do not put a time limit on the start of money. But my chair uh, encouraged me as soon as possible. <laughs> he said, uh, he said uh, if you run off your uh, time and credit clock, then it will take money back anyway. So, <laughs> so you just do it as soon as possible. Uh, but what they do have is how much money you can spend in your first year, how many, much money you can spend in the second year. You can now spend on all your dollars in one year, and that's kind of a limit on that. Um, other than that, so I, I guess the reason I like the, the offer I get from the University of Utah is really have very little uh, limitation in terms of startup fund. Yeah, I, I would echo that. It, it, it does vary um, in terms of there was one place that within the startup they were telling me I could have a tech. Um, and then the, the offers that I liked were the ones that were very, here's your money, do what you want, <laughs> uh, that were less defined. Um, I would say one of those things that is really good to negotiate is the timing um, of your startup. So I, I had a grant coming in, so it was really important to me that I didn't have to spend my startup in three years. Um, and if, you, if you're bringing a grant with you, that's something you definitely want to think about negotiating. And making sure it's actually written, not just verbal. That's probably obvious, but it, I mean that's one of the most important things about negotiating. It's every little detail you can get in that in that letter. So, um, yeah, the startups generally, they I think they, they do. They range from listing specific equipment, and potentially even personnel, to um, just giving you money and guaranteeing or if, just saying what your what your salary is going to be and what you're responsible for at what time. But that's so you sort of touched on getting it written, um, and so is there a contract in the end, or is this all an offer letter, or what is the, I guess it's almost like a legal contract in um, the end? Well, I think, I think the letter, I, I thought of the letter as a contract. Okay, um, and, and along those lines, the reason I asked is I have a friend who's just starting, and he's having an issue with space. And it's starting to actually hindering him. So I'm wondering, when you do this negotiation and you have this letter slash contract, if they don't come through on their end, is there something in the wording there that says you'll push back my tenure track if I don't get this space or this equipment? Or boy, that's an interesting question because I, I I can honestly say I, it, 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 there is a contract, and there is a letter, but it's really a one-page letter. It right. that talks about salary uh, and, uh, and and basically the startup and any any summer salary issues. <laughs> come into play. I can't ever recall that there was space was even mentioned. Right, that's my in, question. In your bio, biology department letter, I mean, there's, I mean, you've been shown space, the, the candidate right. has shown space and said, here's where your lab's going to be. But I don't honestly think that particular component appears in our letters. Even if it was part of the negotiation? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and the letters we put out, we've, we've had space uh, listed there. Um, and I'll, I'm going to get a question of, you know, can you specify the lab and square footage? And, right. Uh, we have, I mean, and, and space is an important issue, right? Uh, because um, um, there are cases where the departments don't really have the space, so you right. need to make sure 
Uh, I've always made sure that when we were going forward to putting an offer together, that we already identified the space. But uh, that may not be universally true in all institutions. So, so is there any, so this was my friend's case, he now has to go and ask the chair to get his space, and he's talking about having to go back and talk about pushing back his tenure clock starting because of this limitation. So is there anything in these letters that deal with if this is not met by this time, then this will happen? You know what I mean? Is there any protection for you? It doesn't sound like there is. Not really. Not yeah. in our literature. Not, yeah. not, let's say, from, from uh, you know, the arts and sciences side. Okay. So it's just something you have in your hand if you have no, to go back to um, I mean, it, it, it's obviously a disturbing situation because the tenure clock, you know, there's, there's leaves that are granted for, for parental leave and so forth. Okay. So, but beyond that, um, you're pretty much bound to that clock. And there's, there's, there's Even if they don't know to their end of the bargain, basically. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why it's a serious problem. Yeah, yeah. Chair, the chair almost affected the department, at least to get a due, can, cannot make a, a, a determination about the tenure clock. Uh, that stands in the hands of the provost. I guess. So that we can they put it in there. But I would say to any of you who are, who are in, the, in the laboratory sciences, if you're looking at a job, and they're, it's getting serious, and, and they don't, they haven't identified the space. So that is very worrisome. Okay. Uh, yeah, I actually have room numbers in my lab. <laughs> <laughs> and square footage, which yeah. made me more comfortable. Yeah. Because uh, I had heard situations like that. I had a friend yeah. who started in a position. I mean, my space was actually getting renovated. Right, that is similar. That's it similar. actually didn't start getting renovated until I got here, but it was okay. Yeah. So I was able to get work done elsewhere. It's, it's like the car pack that show me the space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is nice to have, I don't know. And I mean, the other thing is actually, it's interesting the differences. On, on the medical side, my, my offer letters from medical schools were three pages of these. Yeah, they were really detailed, very, very detailed. I don't know if that's. Yeah, and so engineering, yeah. in the letters we send out, we um, talk about um, general Duke benefits. So we want to make sure it's very attractive to someone. The start date of the offer, when the when the review will occur, you know, uh, uh, what the salary is. Um, we talk about teaching um, uh, responsibilities. Um, usually, not specific courses. There's flexibility there. Um, and then we um, um, itemize the startup package, which would, would include the space. Um, the, in our case, we divide the money between uh, the, the equipment, supplies, and st uh, technician or postdoc. That's all one lump sum, which is you know based on, on the communication. There, um, in, on a university appointment, there's always a question of uh, a summer salary since there's a nine-month appointment, so you do want to be sure of the type of appointment that you have. And the, the, the goal of the summer salary is, is more of a conditional, usually during, we, we do it the first two years, we can provide you know, anywhere from one to three months um, uh, if you haven't received grants. So we make it clear that if you've got the grants and you have the money, then no, we're not going to give that. But uh, that's, that's a backup. Um, uh, and we um, also list graduate student support that will be provided. Uh, automatically for junior faculty and, uh, and then moving expenses. There's, there's usually a line in there about that. We do put a term limit on ours. Uh, that was something a, a prior dean had insisted upon. But oftentimes they can be negotiated up front or um, coming to the um, end of the time period if you need that. I think the philosophy that uh, the dean often has is the money is startup, so it's meant to. Uh, get the, 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 the work started, um, but at the same time, I'm not aware in our school in any case where the money has been taken back. So, I think in arts and sciences, the general sense is that the startup should should carry you for about three years, but I, but nowadays, I think at five, at five, they they have the option of taking the money back. Next question. Is there a provision in the contract that says that it's normal to have in this sort of package in a research or in
resources I had access to, equipment that I had access to, but, but it does vary quite a bit. There will be places where they actually say, um, here's your startup plus we will guarantee you a technician for two years. It does, I think it really does vary. And, and it's a little bit comparing apples to oranges when you start comparing, say, a job at a liberal arts or a university to a medical school. They're, they're pretty different in terms of what the expectations are. So the start packages are probably a little different. I have one thing I would say is if, if graduate students are part of this, you need to talk about how you'll be able to recruit graduate students uh, so that you can get a student in the first year. So that, uh, and then and oftentimes departments you know, will work with you. Question? How do you probably need to have a long time to get How important is what?
me, it, it was really sort of set in stone a little bit more than other things. This is what you offer to assistant professors. But if you have another offer somewhere else, you might be able to work with. Yeah, the chairs are always having to worry about salary equity within the department. And they, they don't want to have to surprise somebody in last year and then suddenly, you know, really jump. Good note, Pat. Yeah, it's actually right now in public school, all the salary has to be published in the state. So it's, uh, it, people really know each other's salary. Yeah, that's a good point for everyone to realize that most public institutions, you can find salary information. The UNC, it's published in the News and Observer. For privates, you can go to the Chronicle of Higher Education. They publish a yearly salary survey. So that's a good way to get all the papers. And I think you got a question, right? Yeah, I was wondering the previous uh, topic and I think this one, but uh, when you were talking about uh, personnel, how do you justify the number of scoring reasonable? So what's reasonable in the segregation of number of postdocs you have and actual grad students? Yeah, uh, how do you put this up? You, you have the model, you can't say I'm going to get five postdocs to get grad students. So what's reasonable? Uh, how do you, how do you gauge that? Well, my, what I typically expect is a person, uh, again, I'm on the university side of this, but they probably would be getting two graduate students in their first year, and then a postdoc or technician. So three to four people of that nature. I would say the, the graduate students will take longer to, to, to start to produce results, but so it might be a different mix, but that's what we look at. Or the or just the that varies the package, and, and you just need to, to clarify that um, uh, how that support will be provided in the duration. Yeah, it would be unusual to support a graduate student for their entire career. Like, it? Yeah, it's usually the first couple of years. And then we also uh, identify other internal sources of funding that are available besides the department support. Uh, uh, the other thing I would suggest doing. it'll also help you see, first of all, it does a couple things. It, it forces you to go around in the lab where you are and see, and actually write down how to numbers of what you need, and equipment. It helps you see what you what you really do need to work about. Because oftentimes it's hard to come up with a number. Um, that speaks less to personnel, I guess, but more to equipment. But that's the sort of thing that I think can help with you early on. Um, but yeah, in terms of personnel, I think I would say it probably is unusual to cover graduates. And often places I mean, such as Duke will pay for graduate students for you know, up to two years. <coughs> and a useful book for that is At the Helm. So that gives a lot of information on setting up your lab. So that's a very good book to look at. There's also one published by the Burroughs Welcome Fund. You can go to their um, website and download it or order a free copy of it. Yeah, it's Howard Hughes. Yeah, it's Howard Hughes, HHMI. It's really good. Bro is welcome. Yeah, so people all have to have that. Okay, question? This is more along the lines of the second timeline. If you are doing multiple interviews, you do have multiple offers coming in, what is will say, I'm waiting on these other offers? I mean, how, how do you navigate if you have multiple offers coming in, if you have multiple interviews? Yeah, that's a tough one because because some universities are also gaining the system by pushing pushing their search in, into the, you know early in the fall, so they've got an offer out, or other people are still thinking about who they're going to interview. And that becomes that becomes a problem. Uh, you just if, if you have if you have an offer somewhere, uh, you know you and, and you're looking somewhere else, you just need to tell them that you know I and, and see it, and then it's up to them to decide how much time they're willing to give you. If they want you bad enough, they'll, they'll give you quite a bit of time. You know, that happened to you, right? You had a University of Russian offer? Or... Yeah, yes. I, I think that if they're interested to you, they give you some time. I, um, my first offer come in December, uh, first year. Then my, uh, my last interview actually started 
March, end of March, so they're really but I mean, you needed to show that you were really interested in, but you also had some is about uh, your progress and uh, you are in a few other places. So when you had your applications out, did you put them all out within a month-long time period? Or when the interviews started coming in, how did those get navigated? Yeah, that's, a, that's an issue. I, I, you, you cannot, do, you couldn't do that because some scoop, uh, you know, put out the hiring announcement that was much later, in like in January or in December, some uh, sent up in September. So I, I sent up many applications in September, October, but I did send up, also send up application in January and then, uh, February of next year. Yes. What is the most tactful way to ask about what kind of sort of packages were offered to recent hires in the department, and when is it appropriate in the process to start asking? Uh, I never asked anybody about salary, for example, because that's just sort of a touchy subject, I feel like, a little bit. Um, so I just, I just tried to use resources to figure out salaries or, or just come up with a, a relative idea. Again, you know, the second is absolutely, it has to come up in the second interview, you know, so that's sort of the you know, it, it, it certainly, and it certainly can come up in, in the first interview, I would say, in, in the first interview, if, if you're getting questions uh, along the lines of what your needs are, I, I, I personally think it's, it's okay for you to ask what sort of, what's the range of startup, of startups that, that have, you know, in recent years. I think that that's a legitimate question, but again, you, you, you don't want those two presumptions in that, in that regard, you know, sort of working into a, into a conversation that has been initiated from their side. And I think that's fine. And, you know, it's probably reasonable. On the second interview, you, you got to you know, know what they're going to do. Yeah, the, the one thing I want to add is um, one interesting case for me is when I negotiated my startup fund with the uh, one university, the chair actually asked me to talk to other faculty in the department. And then there's two faculty. It's basically is. Uh, give the picture, you know, who gets what range of startup funding last year, who gets what. I guess it's not euro, but I that that's could happen. So you um, kind of like the soothing knees, you know, to like me feel comfortable. Okay, the the, the grant uh, the startup fund I got is really in the range of even you know you always like a little bit about the average sense and so that's what we make you feel good about that. Yeah, and, and, but again, it, in, in, in the biology department in particular, it's a pretty, we're a pretty broad range of biology department, and, and some people on the systematics end are not going to have the same sort of laboratory needs that someone in molecular biology is, is going to need. So, so you know, the, that, that startup package may not be uh, in, in pretty near as, as large as, as molecular biology. Is, and, and, but, but again, what, you want, what we want to do when we put together a startup package, we want this purpose, we, we decided this is the person we want to have as a colleague, Want to attract them to do, uh, and so uh, if they can make a case for this is what they need, you know, basically it's what do you need you know, to get your to get your research program up, up and off the ground, and that's you know a, a good university, like you know, which we are, is, is going to try and meet those within again going back to what George said within budget constraints, uh, which in this day and age, oftentimes in some state universities, is going to can be very severe. I was sort of uh, the so-called exploding job offer. Um, I mean, this is my brother-in-law as a law professor, uh, where they gave him like, they gave him an offer and gave him like 24 to 40 hours just like that, just to say yes or no, basically. Um, does, that, does that just not really exist so much in sciences? That's a okay. That'd be unusual. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we, we, we do give us a time frame for a response, but nothing of that short. Usually several weeks, and again, if we're very interested in someone, yes, we, we will extend the, the deadline, so those are changeable, but, but, but nothing that, that short. <laughs> I, for several years, ran with a couple of lawyers on Sunday mornings, and, and, and there we did. It's a different culture. <laughs> yeah, they had a, a, you know, a weekly shocker. You do what? <laughs> there we go. You know, awesome. The academic job market is very different from the business world, for sure. And well, this, is for, this is for like a law professor, so Shenzhen, Columbia. Yeah. Okay, so right. Yeah. Uh, 
that sciences, I guess, are, I would say, because it, I mean, for, for me, when I got a couple, several weeks and the offer was made to bring my family back, which is for, you know, can often be really important decision maker. So they usually want to give you enough time to think about it. So how can you tactfully ask for more time? Like they say, we'd like your answer in three weeks. You say, can I have a little bit longer because I have all these other offers? Or I think if you have, you'd have a you need a rationale for why you need more than three. And then, and then it's up to them to, to accept that rationale or not. I would say. Yeah, just saying I need more time. For the, just purely for the sake of more time. And it's a little bit of, you know, I'm hoping to hear from Harvard. You know, it, and, and I need a couple more weeks. But that's perfectly fine. I think they ask now, they may say no. It's a balancing act, too, because if you want the person, you want to make sure that they're happy coming. Um, and, you know, you, you know that they have other offers, but you hope that the end of the side for you. So you often will be willing, willing to get more time. The mention of family brought up a question. I don't know if it's so much negoti negotiation, but is it appropriate if you're down in sort of the final stages? to ask about a spouse and helping them find a job if they're in science at <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, so definitely. Yeah. I, I, you know, in terms of what they'll do for you, it, <laughs> uh, my husband is not a scientist, but we needed to find a position for him. Um, and some places were really brought him to a career center that wasn't very helpful. We tried to help him find a position. Um, other people really uh, help to find networks, but you, you should make them aware that this is um, yeah, this is something that is plays into your decision. And I mean, coming back to asking for time, sometimes that can be a big factor to kind of figure out what's going to work for your family. When did you bring that up? Like after well, during the negotiation part? Or? Yeah, the second visit. Yeah, the second visit.
those courses are going to be graduate courses or upper level undergraduate courses. There's a whole series of introductory courses that need to be filled. And get, you know, as a faculty member, you're going to have to participate in that. So. And we, we often ask um, the candidates what courses, among the courses that are required that they feel that they can teach. So our goal is not to have them teach anything, but we want them to be an expert in that. That's very helpful for us. But, um, and our policy has usually been teaching a required course that meets a department on need plus an elective course, so that tries to balance it. But, but you, you definitely want to ask about those issues, what type of relief you may get. You know, Duke has a junior faculty leave policy. Uh, other institutions may, so you should inquire about those things. Uh, so, um, you know, to, to see what's available. And if you're on the medical school side, I think it's very, very different. So. <laughs> I had it in my offer letter how much teaching, the range of teaching that was sort of expected. And they actually, I can't remember if it was in the letter or not, to give me a break my first year or not. I ended up deciding to do a couple of classes, just two lectures, and just gave me exposure to graduate students. So it's sort of, you, know, you want to put the work in, but then you get exposure and you start seeing it's nice just to get out of your lab in the first couple months. <laughs> That, you, you asked earlier what might be a, a sort of a showstopper and I asked at the institution or at least say on the campus side here where, where you know, teaching is, is part of the deal. But basically it's saying you didn't want to one, <laughs> one course a year and that would be a small graduate course. You know, that that's not the way we can play friends and influence people. Regarding teaching, I, I want uh, everyone to know that uh, if you cannot negotiate the, a lot of teachers, so probably you can do it to uh, ask them to let your teachers a well-established classes, a course, or, or teach one courses for, for like a three years or four years. The, the, the worst situation is you teach different courses different years, then it would be very challenging. And then if you ask a teacher to a new course, then it would also be very challenging uh, for a young faculty. So, um, you, you do want to bring that up and get a little, a little bit more clarification. I guess what you got is, is really depend on what the department you talk about, but it, it's, it's, it's an important component uh, in the offer letter. A lot of these points deal with you know, sort of how the department views the new faculty, and a good department wants to see the faculty to succeed. I mean, there are obligations you have to in teaching and research and service, but uh, and you'll get a sense of that if, if the, the teaching mode is reasonable that you're you're going to be teaching the same course for many years, if the service expectations are, are modest and so forth. So I think those are all going to tell you that this is the place I want to be. Other questions? Or other questions? I was just going to say the HHMI welcome group. Yes, perfect. Good. Good. 
question. Yeah. And then actually, I have one more. I like this one. Once I receive an offer, is there a chance the offer could be withdrawn if I ask for too much? And there's a chance, yeah, because I mean, if, if, again, if the department can't afford what you're asking. At some point, at some point, George is going to have to say no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the only time we sort of ended negotiations was before the, we got to the offer, and it was not an assistant professional position. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, I try to make sure that the candidate knows what's in the offer letter because we don't want to continually rewrite the letter, so they have a good sense of what's in there. But we have revised some, um, um, and there's always a chance that they think the request becomes unreasonable.
probably be fewer hires. Not not a huge number, fewer, but fewer hires per year than there have been in certainly in the recent past, and certainly in the more distant past. And that's probably going to be true of academia across the board. That, you know, in, in the medical center, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the long-term trend for NIH funding is, is not looking sort of rosy. Choppy, choppy. Yeah. Uh, and so that that will that's got to affect you know the size of the faculties down the road. It's a tough. It's a tough market guys, for you. On that note. <laughs> <laughs> Run. <laughs> Can I read about one lawyer thing that always? <laughs> Submit, if you're the biomedical assistant, but most of you are, you know, when you submit a manuscript that the, 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 it comes back and you've got to sign something that says this hasn't been submitted anywhere else. It's not uncommon for lawyers to submit to 12 places. And then when they get an, an offer, you know, they'll, from some, you know, Princeton Review, they'll go to the Harvard people and say, I've got an offer. I mean, you know, that would be absolutely, well, that's not <laughs> But that's standard, that's standard for, for the way they deal with that, with academic publishing.